Um, dinner in progress in some places. Uh, others have probably just wrapped up work. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to the start of our spring talk series. I'm uh, real excited to host everybody here. And I know that there are quite a few more people that are looking forward to seeing the recording of this session um, after we're done. And I don't want to take too much time. So I'm just going to jump right in and uh, kick us off. So um, I always like to start um, with a land acknowledgement whenever we do any events. And uh, um, recently I've been preparing them, but I, I didn't have enough time. So um, I want to recognize that m my goal with the work that I do with pollinators and native plants um, was largely influenced by um, concepts of ecosystem care and relationships that we hold that come from Indigenous community members in Southern Ontario. Um, at a gathering of elders at Trent University, I, I heard words spoken that are ecological in nature, but belied in them such a different understanding of the relationships that we hold in these ecosystems than I was used to, that I really only found the equivalent of that connection within the pollinator world, because all of our lovely pollinator friends have such beautiful and unique relationships with all of these plants that have been here um, for millennia. And it's also important to recognize that a lot of these plants wouldn't be here without the trade and uh, cultivation and movement of seed by the peoples who have fostered and cared for this, this land we now know as North America um, for thousands and thousands of years. So I hope that the work that we continue to do, all of us uh, interested in planting native plants and creating these habitats and so on, um, do it with the recognition of the incredible amounts of knowledge and sacrifice that went into building these biodiverse ecosystems in the first place. And so hello to everyone from Nogojiwanong, uh, Treaty 20 Territory. I work for Pollinator Partnership Canada, whose head office is in Treaty 13 Territory in Toronto. Um, and I would like to greatly thank and acknowledge the um, ongoing stewardship of lands and waters by the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, and the Wendat peoples um, that continue to, to live here and care for the space that we all share. And uh, with that, I'd like to say that we are going to be continuing to share more of these spaces with hopefully more of you <laughs> uh, for a talk a month for the next four months. I'm noticing that there are a lot more talks going on. So the hope for Project Swallowtail this year is to have a few more events that are in person, so fingers crossed, um, but uh, to, to keep everybody uh, you know, used to Zoom. We don't, want to, we don't want to get so far away from Zoom that in case we have to use it again, everyone forgets it. So, you know, just once a month. Um, and I'll be in touch with you uh, once again, once this session is over with uh, registration links for all these talks. But there's some really cool ones coming up. And finally, just some quick housekeeping. I'll ask everyone to just please keep your video and microphones off until the very end. Uh, I changed this. <laughs> Uh, from a uh, webinar format to a meeting format so that we can all see each other at the very end. Um, but that means that, you know, your microphones and your videos are visible um, and audible whenever you don't turn them off. So really appreciate that. Uh, this session will be recorded. You will have seen the prompt from Zoom at the very top uh, when you joined in, but uh, I will be recording and sharing this uh, on our YouTube playlist and I will share the link with you all in the follow-up email I have. And I would ask that if you have programming related questions for Project Swallowtail to please save them to the very, very end if we really just run out of questions for Anthony tonight. Um, and I invite you to please email me at jk.pollinator.org or admin at projectswallowtail.ca if you have any questions. 
And thank you for listening to me. I'm going to now pass it off to the person I am looking forward to hearing from tonight. Anthony, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. This is kind of the biggest talk I've ever had. Um, so it's going to be both nerve wracking and exciting. So I know there's a lot of anticipation here. Uh, so hopefully I kind of deliver a little bit. Um, but let me go ahead and, and get this shared. Okay. Gotta love Zoom. Uh, all right, can everyone see that? Oh, there's. Okay. All right. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for joining. Um, I'm kind of loosely associated with Project Swallowtail, but I'm uh, primarily a second year master's student uh, working with the Rehan Lab at York University. And my project pertains to uh, how urbanization is affecting pollinators and their plant pollinator interactions within the southwestern portion of the Toronto area. I know some of you are probably from Virginia, where I'm from. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap here, but it might be a little different. So hopefully there's some entertainment for you. Um, but as a lot of you may know, land use change is one of uh, the larger drivers for biodiversity change within ecosystems. Uh, most of this is anthropogenically driven uh, with the two major causes being urban expansion, uh, being urban sprawl and intensification, and then agricultural expansion, uh, really as a way of accommodating for growing populations. Um, specifically within the Toronto area, the uh, kind of urban area has spread from about 1100 kilometers squared to about 2200 kilometers squared between the period of 1974 to 2014. And that's only projected to increase uh, as populations continue to increase in the future as well. Um, and with this kind of land use change associated with both urbanization and agriculture, there's uh, significant kind of damage done to habitat, whether that be with habitat loss or, or degradation. And this has uh, impacts on a variety of different organisms ranging from birds, uh, aquatic insects, bats, uh, and also bees. Uh, but since most of my work kind of revolves within the urban sphere, I'll be focusing within that aspect. Um, so within urban areas, you have kind of two primary factors that make up the urban environment. You have landscape factors and local factors. These landscape factors pertain to the entire cityscape itself. So you can think of the urban heat island effect as a landscape factor. And that's um, just the notion that the urban area tends to have a higher temperature than the surrounding area, primarily as a result of the urban area uh, consisting of a lot of built up surfaces that contain heat. Uh, and then some local factor characteristics pertain to the more uh, isolated microcosmic environments within an urban landscape. So you can think of a park or someone's yard, for example, as a isolated area and there are factors within that particular environment that are local. So you can think of the microclimate as one example of that. And these factors often interact with one another. So local factors can influence other local factors. They can influence landscape factors and vice versa. And so these interactions between landscape and local factors often create an idiosyncratic environment such that not one particular city is going to have the same influence or same composition of factors um, compared to each other. So uh, a city like Lynchburg, Virginia, where I'm from, may be drastically different from a city like Toronto, uh, especially in the ways that they're constructed, organized, and their prioritization for a biodiversity example. And so what does this have on bees broadly? Uh, within the research or the literature, uh, urbanization generally has a negative effect on richness and abundance. So you tend to find a decrease of richness and abundance of bees in cities, especially compared to natural environments. Um, and in particular, uh, cities tend to filter out bees according to functional traits. And these are just characteristics that enable uh, organisms to thrive and survive in their environments. So for bees, uh, this includes dietary preferences. Are they uh, host specialists or are they generalists? Do they nest in the ground um, or do they nest in cavities? And are they large, small bodied bees? Uh, and this also includes their sociality. Are they solitary or are they use social? Uh, and so these, uh, and within the city, these uh, this filtering effects occur. So you have a reduced 
uh, kind of diversity of these functional traits. So whereas in this top portion of this diagram, you have all these different functional traits represented perhaps within a natural ecosystem, uh, within a city that gets uh, filtered by those factors I described previously, such that you have, uh, for instance, more generalist species and less specialist species or no specialist species. Um, and then you have different body size, by body size species, as well as um, species that uh, nest in cavities, uh, more individuals that nest in cavities, for example. Um, and so uh, in conjunction with how unique cities can be uh, and their factors that play into that uniqueness, cities can have a varying effect on different bees and their community compositions. Um, and in fact, Despite having a general negative trend on bees broadly, um, some cities can have a considerable degree of biodiversity. Um, and in fact, a recent review uh, revealed that cities tend to have a higher richness and abundance compared to agricultural landscapes where we're used to thinking of bees being. Uh, and so one of these areas of importance for bees, particularly within cities are green spaces. And these are just uh, vegetative patches found throughout cities. Uh, that vary in size due to fragmentation. Uh, and the types of kind of ground cover and plants that exist in these spaces uh, is dependent on what these kind of uh, locations are used for and whatever purpose they're uh, kind of delegated to um, depend or results in the type of management and floral preference of, of humans that is kind of put into those particular sites. So you have uh, sites like golf courses that are pretty heavily managed and have virtually no floral preference um, that are pretty harsh for bees. And then you have uh, sites like someone's residential yard uh, that's cooperating with Project Swallowtail that is exclusively uh, promoting biodiversity in their yard, leaving things kind of grown in um, and planting plants that are specifically um, catered towards particular pollinators. Um, so for those people that are interested in particular plants, um, there's a lot of questions of what plants to be planting that's still kind of an open area of research and one that I'm trying to get into um, and hopefully can answer uh, with part of this presentation and later on as I do more data analysis, but work still continues on uh, kind of looking at the efficacy between non-native and native plants with the general consensus being that native plants are favored, uh, non-native plants can extend floral um, flowering season if other plants aren't available. Um, but generally natives are preferred. And then there's annuals versus perennials, and that's mainly a management issue. And then taxonomy pertaining to which particular flowers are preferable to uh, particular species or genera of bees. And so why does this all matter within an urban context? We're uh, used to hearing that bees are important for our food um, and are generally considered within agricultural ecosystems. Um, part of the reason is because urban studies are uh, way less done uh, in comparison to agricultural uh, ecosystems, primarily because of our, their association with producing food. Um, but urban agriculture still exists. Uh, in fact, uh, it's potentially possible for about 10% of Toronto's produce to uh, occur within the city itself through ab urban agri agriculture. So promoting these poll pollinators within urban spaces is essential just from a sustainability or a food security standpoint in and of itself. Additionally, uh, within cities, uh, a lot of people aren't as exposed to insects generally outside of conventional pests such as cockroaches, bed bugs, fleas, all the nasty guys. Uh, and so promoting uh, the beneficial pollinators that do exist within them and get more people appreciating those insects um, and caring more about the natural world around them. And then the general health benefits associated with uh, of the outdoors and green spaces in cities, whether it be mental uh, well-being associated with green spaces or the physical elements associated with being outdoors, uh, enabling you to exercise and do whatever. Uh, and then uh, specific for my work, uh, informing management and policy decisions so that we can encourage a coexistence between our growing kind of urban infrastructure and the natural ecosystem, especially as populations expand. Uh, we'll have to find ways of integrating uh, our world with the natural world sustainably so that not, we're not further degrading it and um, reducing that biodiversity that we care a lot about, uh, especially as 68% of the global population is expected to live in cities by 2050. 
Um, so for my particular work, I'm focusing on two main questions for my master's thesis. The first one is kind of getting a general consensus or idea of what the richness and abundance of uh, beads existing with Toronto are. Um, I'm kind of hypothesizing that uh, richness and abundance will decrease, especially as uh, the gradient of urbanization increases, and I'll explain that a little later. Um, just going along with the literature that currently exists, and then I'll be looking at how plant bee interactions are, are changing across a gradient of increasing urbanization. Um, and I'm predicting that these uh, uh, interactions are going to be reduced, uh, not as complex, especially as um, certain functional traits start to disappear from the environment. Um, so to begin all this work, uh, I spent a couple months uh, looking at satellite data uh, through ArcGIS and choosing approximately 10 sites per uh, three types of urbanization intensity going from low to medium to high. Uh, these sites were about 25 meters squared uh, in, in size or greater. Um, and I calculated the imperviousness uh, based off the amount of built up or area around each site within a 250 diameter buffer. Um, so if you look at this map, uh, these are all the sites I had. Each one's color coordinated toward uh, what urbanization intensity they are. Um, and so I would calculate the amount of built up area within this radius to determine the percentage of uh, urbanization of particular sites. And so the kind of criteria for each um, category is indicated below. Uh, most of the sites within the same intensity, um, so all the green sites and all the yellow sites and all the red sites are kept about a kilometer away from each other, and this is to account for bee foraging distances. Uh, some of the larger bees, such as your bumblebees and uh, large carpenter bees, can travel about uh, 1.2 to 1 kilometer uh, in distance, uh, with some going as far as a kilometer and a half, um, but your smaller and medium-sized bees uh, tend to go a little shorter than that uh, with your smaller bees kind of barely eking out of the each radius of the sites um, going around 150 to 350 uh, meters out uh, in a radius so they don't go too terribly far. Um, for the assessing of bee richness and abundance, uh, bee richness and abundance across sites, sorry, I saw. Um, uh, sampling occurred through early May through early October, in which we conducted passive and active sampling. Passive sampling is pretty much just uh, setting traps down and forgetting them, whereas active sampling is physically kind of uh, catching things either with a net or with a vacuum. Uh, the bees collected from these were pinned, labeled, and then later identified for data analysis. Uh, specifically for Passive sampling, uh, about 10 pan traps or um, plastic cups of blue, yellow, and white color uh, were alternatively placed uh, at sites, and these had soapy water in them to break the surface tension and catch bees. Uh, and these were placed before active sampling occurred, so before 9.30 a.m., and these were collected after 4 p.m. And then at each site, a single unbaited blue vein trap was hung at each site, uh, and these were checked by weekly for any bees and then they were redeployed as well. Um, I have an asterisk next to unbaited because uh, I plan on baiting these with propylene glycol in this upcoming summer, because uh, when it would rain, these traps would just fill with nasty gunk uh, and the bees did not look great. Uh, and they made me quite sad. So hopefully if I bait them with something different, uh, they will not be quite as stinky and disgusting. Um, for my active sampling, uh, this occurred between 9.30 and 4 p.m., in which we would go to sites, take note of the plants blooming at each location, and then we would monitor these plants for approximately 10 minutes, where we would catch any bees visiting those plants, uh, and then store those in either ethanol or freeze them later to humanely euthanize them. And this is an, an example of the vacuum that was used to catch generally smaller bees. Bumblebees don't really fit in there. Uh, too well, and then uh, manually netting was the other method that we use for active sampling. Uh, to kind of assess our uh, sampling effectiveness across sites and along the gradient, we'll be using a rarefaction curve, which probably doesn't matter to a lot of uh, people here who are just gardeners or don't care too much about the stats involved. Um, but this is pretty much to examine our uh, sampling effectiveness. So 
an example is at the bottom of the screen where you have an exponential growth uh, as you catch more common species and that begins to plateau as uh, your rate of catching tends to decline and rarer species remain to be uncaught. And then we'll be using statistical models to evaluate that kind of effectiveness across each intensity. And then the next part of uh, my statistical analysis uh, requires the construction of these bipartite networks, uh, which look kind of intimidating. And there's a couple examples on the right side, and you can run a number of different statistical uh, uh, statistical uh, network uh, level stuff um, on the different plant, plant pollinator networks within the city. And so uh, you have network level statistics, which includes the entire kind of rectangle, if you want to look at the one at the top right. Um, so the entire network itself, uh, you can analyze how that's changing across the network and then species level. So each of these individual black boxes uh, or nodes as they're called, uh, you can statistically just look at the species within the network. Uh, and then we'll be using generalized linear mix effects models to analyze how those are potentially differing across gradient of urban as well. Um, to touch on these a little bit more, because I'll throw a couple at you later uh, for the ones that have actually resulted from my work here. Um, I'm just going to describe these briefly. They're just kind of graphical representations of ecological interactions, and they're not just limited to plant pollinator interactions, although uh, they're highly used in these kind of interactions. Um, they're primarily made with the R package bipartite. Um, but other interactions that have been noted include predator-prey network interactions, seed disperser network interactions, and I recently saw one uh, that looked at dung beetles and their interactions with different types of dung. Um, so there's a wide array of uses, and they can take a bunch of different shapes and colors, such as the rectangular one up top or the circular one at the bottom. Um, and as I said, you can do different uh, levels of analyses with these at this. Um, so for some of these preliminary results that a lot of people are looking forward to, um, here's some raw counts of just genera abundance. So overall, there's about 5,300 individuals um, collected uh, throughout the season from May to October, with about 26 genera being represented out of all those individuals. Toronto has about 32 genera of bee. Most of these uh, bees belong to uh, or the top five, at least, are dominated by the Holictidae and the Apidae family, so the sweat bee family, and then the Apidae family includes your honeybees, bumblebees, your squash bees, which is the fourth bee on the, uh, going from left to right. Um, and so looking at this graph here, you can see an overwhelming majority of bees uh, are in the genus Agapostomin, uh, followed by, unsurprisingly, your honeybee, and then the common eastern bumblebee, and then your subgenus Lasia glossum dialectus, and then your squash bees kind of come in uh, last place for the top five most abundant. Um, most of these bees are ground nesting, um, which is somewhat contradictory with some uh, city studies uh, as a lot of ground cover is covered in pavement. So it makes uh, nesting in the ground more difficult for bees. Um, so that's a little bit surprising, but not completely contradictory to all studies, as there are studies that have reported an abundance of ground nesting bees in cities. And most of these bees are generalists, so they tend to feed on multiple different host plants. For bee abundance across each of the three uh, gradient types, urbanization types, uh, the high intensity urbanization had the lowest number of individuals recorded the medium intensity had the highest, perhaps, uh, perhaps surprising to some of you. And then uh, the low intensity had an kind of intermediate amount of bees captured at around 1800. Uh, and I think the reason that the medium urbanization had a higher number of individuals uh, recorded compared to the low was just because some of the low sites happened to be uh, urban parks uh, where uh, they were pretty heavily managed and the species richness and abundance for flowers was fairly low. And some of the sites for the medium intensity tended to be people's yards uh, who generally uh, left things pretty unmanaged uh, or did very minimal management um, and, and tended to grow particular flowers uh, for pollinators. Um, but when looking at the statistical significance at whether or not these differences mattered, 
it was not statistically significant. Um, it's perhaps unsurprising considering these numbers are, although they're different, they're not too far away from each other. Um, when looking at the top five sites across all of the sites in terms of the number of beads captured, most of these sites were again at the medium intensity and these were at people's yards primarily with one site each from the high and low intensity being um, in the top five as well. What's interesting about here is that three out of these five are Project Swallowtail sites. Um, out of the 29 sites I have, four to, I mean, five to six of those are Project Swallowtail sites. Um, so I thought it was an interesting observation that about half to a little over half uh, ended up having the highest abundance of bees overall across all the sites, regardless of kind of their urbanization. Um, and so for the next slide I have here, this is a presence absence graph showing uh, the presence of a particular genus at each of the sites at uh, the high intensity urbanization. Um, this is a little hard to see, so I put it into a table to make it easier. So the average number of genera observed at the high intensity urbanized sites was about 11 with the highest one coming from a project swallowtail site that I'm not gonna disclose uh, with about 21 genera recorded. For the medium intensity, I made the same graph and made a similar table, but the average was about 15 um, with the highest number of genera being uh, at one site with 20 genera and then the low urbanization having an average of 14. Again, these numbers weren't statistically significant and they're about a number or two off, so why would they be? Um, and then the site with the highest number of genera recorded uh, was the northern portion of High Park with 18 genera. Um, and so like with the abundance uh, data where the intermediate uh, urbanization had the highest number of uh, abundant bees, um, the intermediate or middle medium urbanization also had the highest average number of genera recorded. Uh, and then unsurprisingly, the high intensity urbanization had the lowest number of genera recorded um, and also had the site with the lowest number of genera recorded. Uh, the most interesting aspect I would say, and this is the entire graph altogether, um, is that a high intensity site ended up having the most number of genera recorded across all sites. Um, observed or surveyed throughout this uh, season. Again, this was a Project Swallowtail site. Whether or not this is because what Project Swallowtail is working is another question, um, but it is just another interesting observation. Um, so next I had just a general checklist of the bees that were collected throughout the summer. Um, so this is the Andrenid family, the mining bee family. Um, most of these are native and they nest in the ground. Um, there is one non-native species. Overall, about 30 species from this family was collected, uh, with these three highlighted being the top three, uh, Andrina comata, Crategi, and then Wilkella. Again, Wilkella being a non-native species. Next is the Apidae family, which again includes your honeybees, bumblebees, uh, large and small carpenter bees, and your longhorn bees. Um, the top three uh, species found were Unsurprisingly, the honeybee with 700, uh, followed by the squash bee, which is Eusera pepinapis bruinosa, and then the common eastern bumblebee, Bombus. Uh, and then a couple more individuals from the APD family. Most of these uh, on the screen are kleptoparasitic species, uh, and the presence of kleptoparasitic species can be an indication of healthy bee communities, as if they're hosts aren't present in the environment, then they themselves would not be present. Um, so it is encouraging having at least some kleptoparasitic species, although this isn't all that has been observed in this table. Um, overall within this family, about 41 species have been observed. And then for the colletted family, this is the mast bees, as is pictured on the right side of the screen, and your uh, plasterer bees, about 12 species were collected. The top three belonging to the genus Hylaeus, uh, three species overall being non-native and the most common within this family uh, being a non-native species and the one being pictured on the right of the screen. Uh, the sweat bee family had roughly 19 species recorded um, with the top three species or most abundant species being two members of the genus Agapostamin and the subgenus Dialectus 
uh, as I identify those the species that might change, so Holictus ligatus might be the third most abundant, or a member within the subgenus Dialectus might end up taking that third place. Um, but Agapossum ivorescens was overwhelmingly the most abundant bee throughout this um, kind of survey. Um, and it's pictured here on the right, and this is the unofficial official bee of Toronto. So kind of exciting that purity representative of what we found. Uh, within the leafcutter resin uh, mason bee family, the Megachylidae family, uh, we have quite a considerable number of non-native species compared to the other families. Uh, overall, we have about 24 species that have been uh, currently recognized, with the top three being uh, two members of the genus Calistoma and one being Megachyla rotundata. And then for bee abundance overall, this is, or species abundance overall, these are the uh, top 10 most abundant species found throughout all of the sites uh, that we had. You'll find that it's kind of similar, uh, a similar trend with the the abundance, genera abundance. So uh, the major players uh, being Agapostum and Baresens, uh, Apis mollifera, uh, squash bees again, Eucera, uh, and the Dialectus subgenus, kind of making up the majority of that abundance. Um, and here's the top five listed here. So you can see it's not very different uh, from the genera abundance that I showed you previously. Again, still being dominated by the two families, Holicidae and Apidae. Um, however, the most species were recorded in the family Apidae and the family Andrinidae. Overall, about 126 species of bee have been recorded. This number is expected to go up as I start identifying some of the dialectus bees. Um, there's roughly over 350 species of bee in Toronto, um, so almost half of the bees previously recorded in Toronto have been recorded within just this small uh, portion of Toronto. For the uh, top abundant uh, species for the high urbanization, uh, here's a list of the top 10. Still a similar trend to the overall. You might have a species or two that's different from the overall the top five looking generally the same, so it's not too interesting and I won't spend too much time with it. Um, but the total species recorded for this urbanized uh, intensity is 69. Uh, for the medium intensity, again, I thought maybe showing top 10, which shows something interesting with the bee communities that are most abundant, but it's still pretty similar overall uh, to what's been seen at the species level that I've been showing you and at the genus level. Um, but the total number this level is uh, 95. And then for the low intensity, still a similar trend uh, with the types of most abundant species, Agapostum and still making up the bulk or the highest number of uh, most abundant species. And then your honeybee and your sub, uh, genus Dialectus making up the top five as well, uh, with the total number of species being 97. So overall, uh, the low intensity ended up having the highest number of species recorded, um, but just about by uh, one or two species compared to the medium intensity. Um, so I was, I was curious about how the native and non-native species differed, uh, the proportion differed across the uh, gradient of urbanization. Um, so overall across all sites, uh, roughly 14 species out of the 126 were uh, non-native, so about 11% uh, were non-native. Um, but interestingly, the uh, amount or the proportion of non-native species is relatively the same across all sites. It's not too terribly different. Uh, and this is the same even looking at the number of individual bees that are native versus non-native as well. That's around 20%. Um, so about one in five bees uh, found over the course of the summer happened to be a non-native individual. Um, but overall, the uh, number of non-native species um, didn't vary too, too much. And I know a lot of you are interested in the flowers and the uh, different plants that are available, especially through Project Swallowtail. So I made a table or of the different families observed throughout the summer. Um, I was going to do genus and species, but there are just a bit too many uh, to put here in table format. So I just had the families listed. Uh, by far the most rich family species wise is the Asteraceae or the 
Astor family. And then if we continue on to this next slide, the uh, second and third most rich uh, species rich families are the mint family, the Lamiaceae, and the rose family, Rosaceae. Um, when looking at the top 10 species of flowers that had the most interactions between uh, themselves and any bee species across all sites, uh, these are the top 10 species we have, uh, with the top five being Solidago canadensis, so Canadian goldenrod, uh, Agastache funiculum, uh, a mint, uh, a non native heliotropium uh, that was just found at one site, uh, a, another goldenrod, and then New England aster. Most of these, again, are dominated by the Asteraceae family. Um, again, about 60 species have been found uh, for that particular family, which is an overwhelming amount compared to any of the other plant families seen. Um, but overall, about 54 families were observed, 177 genera, and then within that, 231 species. This is assuming um, that we identified everyone, everything correctly. I'm not a perfect botanist, and I'm myself, so hopefully that true. Uh, when comparing the plants that are made available through Project Swallowtail with what was seen in the field, I made a couple tables here. Uh, this table on the left shows the plant species that were observed uh, throughout any of the sites across the season that are made available through Project Swallowtail, and if I missed any, um, please let me know. Um, but these have been made available and had interactions with bees have been found. And then this table on the right side represents uh, plants that aren't made available through Project Swallowtail, um, but they belong to the same genus as a plant species that is made available through Project Swallowtail. Uh, the only difference here is that uh, they had some kind of interaction with the bee to be recorded here. Um, and so it might be worth uh, uh, checking out some of these plants uh, to see if they're worth uh, promoting pollinators, particularly bee, but perhaps not these two listed as they're not native. And I know Project Swallowtail is exclusively about planting native plants. Um, so maybe the strawberry, the liatris, and the anemone are a couple plants to look for. Going back to the uh, graph that I showed you previously for the top 10 uh, most interacted with species, uh, I just wanted to note that four out of these top 10 are native plants um, that received a considerable amount of interactions um, that aren't made available to Project Swallowtail as well. Um, so these might also be plants worth looking into um, with regard to uh, promoting particular pollinators such as bees. Um, so for the bipartite networks, these look kind of intimidating, especially with the amount of plants uh, observed and the number of bees captured throughout the season. Um, but these just show the number of interactions between bees and plants. Um, so you have the bees in blue at the bottom of the screen, and this is at the genus level. And then you have the plants in the top. Um, the bee, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and spoil it. The uh, bee communities were the most uh, interactive bees. Uh, so the apis, the bombus, uh, and the agapostamin to name a couple, uh, the thicker bars, um, remains relatively consistent throughout the high, medium, and low urbanization intensity. Um, so I just want to keep the attention mainly to the plants, um, because those change a little bit at each urbanization intensity. So if we notice here, we have uh, goldenrod being a major player, getting a lot of interactions, the width of these bars uh, representing the number of interactions uh, that particular species receiving, or genus in this case, receiving from uh, the bees in this case for the goldenrod. It's receiving a considerable amount of uh, visits from bees compared to other uh, plant gen genera. Uh, the next one being uh, bellflower, the campanula, and then allium, uh, gallardia, and then heliopsis being kind of the top five most interacted with at the high intensity here. Um, and then if you wanted to look at these further, um, I won't explain them too much because they're, um, you can see like, for example, the goldenrod, uh, about a third of those interactions. If you can see this yellow kind of link 
uh, are coming from the Hylaeus genus, for example. So you can see the proportion of interactions coming from particular uh, genera of bees. Uh, I plan on making these for the species level, um, but I just need to get the dialect identified. So this is for the medium intensity, and this shows you something similar might not look too different, but you might notice a couple different plants. Um, so for in this particular case, it's pretty apparent that the Symphiotricum uh, genus has been a big player in terms of interactions. Um, and this is the Aster family. There are multiple species recorded across sites, um, but of course the most um, interactive with species being the New England Aster, which is a project swallowtail plant. Uh, and then goldenrod, again, being another highly uh, interacted with plant, along with this mint, um, salvia, and uh, monarda, or bee balm. And then at the low intensity, um, you see a couple of different other plants taking shape here. So we have heliotropium, which is a non-native in the borage family. Goldenrod, once again. Uh, trifolium, which is uh, white clover. Uh, teractacum, which is dandelion and sylphium or cup plant. Um, and I'm imagining the uh, white clover and the dandelion being a result again of those uh, parks that are highly managed, not having a lot of um, floral richness or abundance, um, accounting for a lot of uh, these interactions here as those are the primary plants that are growing at those sites where everything gets mowed and weed whacked away. Um, so there's different network level statistics you can do here. Um, for the entire network. And so you can look at uh, connectance, for example, which is just the number of interactions that occurs uh, within the network out of all the possible interactions that can take place. So overall, uh, connectance is fairly low. Um, so the closer to one it is, the higher connectance is. But for each individual urbanized intensity, it's fairly low. Um, so this could indicate a, a not a very robust bee community. Um, however, what's interesting, and I'm not sure why, uh, the connectance is fairly high overall, um, but just at in each individual urbanized area, the, uh, the connectance is fairly low. Uh, weighted nestedness is the kind of overlap in resources that exist between sites. This again is somewhat low, uh, not too high. Um, so this could indicate a potential uh, sensitivity to disturbance. Uh, however, what is interesting is that robustness for both bees and plants is relatively high. Uh, and robustness just means um, how resilient um, a particular trophic level, so bees, for example, are to the removal of plant species, for example, from the environment. Um, so with the removal of either bees or plants, it seems like either group is fairly robust, being more so in the medium and high intensities, um, but not significantly so compared to the uh, high urbanized area. And then you have interaction evenness, which is also uh, fairly low. And that's just the uh, amount of diversity of interactions that occurs between intensity. Uh, for the species level stats, uh, I only did degree here. Uh, and this is the number of unique interactions that a genus has, in this case, with other, uh, with plant genera. Um, and so, what you'll notice here is a lot of the uh, major players throughout this entire talk in terms of the most abundant species and most abundant genera also have tended to have the highest number of degree or unique interactions. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, because they tend to be generalists, so they're visiting a lot of different uh, flowering plants. Uh, they're not as picky as other bees. Um, and then rarer bees, which aren't represented in this table, Gen, uh, generally had lower degrees, um, so especially species in which only one individual was caught, and so they would only have about a degree of one since they were only caught from one plant. Um, I'll also be doing pollinator service index, which kind of uh, measures the effectiveness of a uh, particular pollinator at pollinating plants, um, but at the genus level, it just doesn't make sense uh, to do this, so this will be a statistic I'll be doing later. Um, so for some takeaway points here, uh, approximately about a third of the bee species recorded previously uh, within the city have been recorded here. Um, so again, about over 350 species of bee have been recorded in Toronto and about uh, 126 to 130 have been uh, currently recorded here. 
uh, just within this small region, which is somewhat exciting. Um, for in terms of abundance, um, most of these species are ground nesting and generalist. Um, so for gardeners out there uh, who are eager to get out in the garden, it uh, may be ideal to hold back on your management as best as you can, at least until around mid-April, just so the, you can ensure that these bees are uh, already out and about um, and you're not kind of disturbing where they're hibernating for the time being. Uh, and this is also true for the cavity nesting bees that may be nesting in the stems in your yard as well. Um, as you're pruning, you could be cutting away hibernating bees and so that'd be no good. Um, so especially for these ground nesting bees, leaving leaves and other sorts of debris so they can finish out their hibernation and emerge properly um, is ideal. Uh, and then within the urban gradient itself, it doesn't appear uh, to significantly affect richness and abundance, uh, no matter where you are at the low or high urbanized spectrum. Um, but there's more statistics to do on that. Uh, just currently, it doesn't appear to have an effect, um, but I'll keep you all updated on that. And then, although I need to run some more statistics, because again, this is all still preliminary, um, there's a couple plants that may be worth looking into, especially for uh, people that are interested in planting native plants uh, and promoting uh, bees in particular. Um, so these include Solidago canadensis or Canadian goldenrod, uh, cup plant and um, cut leaf coneflower. And another thing people might ask me is, okay, did you see anything cool? Um, whatever, I don't care about all these stats. Uh, I'm interested in biodiversity and that's what got me into bees in the first place. And so it's nice to be able to see this uh, kind of biodiversity in an urban setting. And so here's some examples we have here. Uh, this helioxys and triopeolis are uh, gleptoparasitic bees. So they'll lay their eggs in other bee nests. And again, uh, they can be good indicator species. And then the Kelostoma is a native species um, that's a specialist on mock orange. Uh, and then we have this particular individual that we caught uh, on goldenrod uh, this summer. Um, if you look through the 2017 Bees of Toronto checklist, um, they have a bunch of bees that they found and that's where I got the statistics for the amount of species existing in Toronto from. Um, the identification we gave this bee is not in there. And so this could be a new record for the city, um, but we'll take it with a grain of salt um, because the checklist is somewhat outdated. It came out in 2017 um, and also it could be some, but we sent it for DNA barcoding uh, to, get, to get a confirmation on that to see if we have a new uh, represented uh, species in Toronto. And this was not only caught on goldenrod, but it was caught from a project swallowtail set. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Um, so for my further research, uh, my further to-do list, uh, so to speak, I got to finish the species level identification for the dialectal subgenus, um, in addition to noting the functional traits associated with all the bees collected, um, so I can do more functional trait analysis to see how those traits are being potentially filtered in Toronto or not. Uh, and then continue doing bipartite statistics, um, particularly at the species level, so doing pollinator service index, um, as well as some group level statistics so I can evaluate how bees themselves or plants themselves are faring along a gradient of urbanization and then doing the statistics associated with that. And then finally, continuing to collect more data this upcoming summer uh, to kind of corroborate or substantiate some of the findings that I've had um, this summer um, as I continue to compile more. Um, so I want to thank you all for listening again. I uh, hope I fulfilled some expectations. Uh, there's still a lot more to do um, as a lot of time has been identifying bees, but I do want to thank you all for listening again. Thank you for Project Swallowtail for allowing me to give this talk and for the participants to allow me to intrude in their yard and collect bees. And thank you to the Rehan Lab for putting up with my nonsense and helping me out. So thank you. And I'll be glad to take any questions. And this is another bee caught off goldenrod. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, one of our uh, participants had to leave, but she uh, uh, thanked you for conducting this important research and sharing your findings. Um,
thank you so much. That was that was fascinating. You found so many things. Yeah. It's hard to <laughs> figure out where to go with all the data. Yeah, that that's incredible. All right. Well, um, folks, we've got about nine minutes with Anthony. Uh and you can turn your video on, or if you're not comfortable with that, you can just uh, put the questions in the chat, or you can turn your mic on and ask a question if you like. Uh, I'll kick us off with a question that's already in the chat. Um, by non-native bees, are we talking about coming from different continents or from different parts of this continent? Uh, so most of the non-native species here are primarily from Europe uh, and Asia, so that they're not from uh, the continent. Um, I believe actually all the non-natives here have been introduced somewhere other than North America. Uh, I don't think there's one that's from another region, um, but most of them are from another continent, primarily Europe. Cool. I had a question about, um, so the highest number of non-native bee species were in, the, I forget which genus, but in, in, why do you think that one? I would have thought that Apidae would have. I think it is the, um, I think the Apis, I think the Apis is the highest genus or the most abundant non-native, um, which is pretty unsurprising if you'll let me mm. go kind of lagging. Um, yeah, no worries. Great. I think it is the honeybee. Uh, you had some other individuals, um, so like Hylaeus punctatus, which with about 90, I think, individuals. It's kind of doing its own thing now. Um, and then you had Mega Kylie Rotundata, uh, I think with 70. Um, but I think an overwhelming majority of the non-native, um, the most abundant non-native species was the honeybee, which is hmm. unsurprising because that's a favorite bee of people. And um, it's just a common one that has been introduced for some time now. Um, okay, uh, we got another question. Uh, do you find non-native bees on invasive or non-native plants? Um, so you'll find them, uh, it depends. So uh, for example, um, the Kelostoma, the two non-native Kelostoma, uh, they tend to be specialists on bellflower, which is also non-native. Um, so there is some overlap in uh, non-native bees foraging on non-native plants but you'll also have non-natives on native plants as well, which can um, potentially compete with native bees that are trying to forward plants as well. Right on. Okay, uh, could you clarify again uh, the difference between high, medium, and low urbanization? Yeah, um, so if you'll let me do this. Yeah, so it's just the amount of built up surface uh, that surrounds a particular site. So on this map here, you'll have uh, these dots with circles around them. Um, so within that kind of colored circle, it's the amount of built up surface, whether that's building or concrete uh, within that circle. Um, and so a high urbanized area would be uh, an area in which that built up area constitutes about 75% or more built up area, uh, intermediate being about 50 to 74%, and then uh, the low urbanized, so uh, a region like High Park uh, would have like a urbanized or built up surface area of less than 49. Okay, cool. Um, did you find many bees that are specialists on just a few plant species? Uh, yeah, there are. There were a couple of specialists. Um, so one of the bees I showed at the end one that's a specialist of mock orange. Um, that is the only native species in the genus Kelostoma in Toronto. Um, the other two are the non-natives. Uh, and it's a specialist on mock orange. Um, so plants in that genus. And it was only found at I think two or three sites. Uh, and then there's a couple other bees, I'm trying to remember off the top. Um, there are specialists on like goldenrod as well. Um, some of the uh, andrina are specialists on um, sunflower plants, so the helianthus. Uh, and then you have uh, a lot of your longhorn bees um, 
which aren't necessarily specialists uh, tend to be uh, found on asters. Um, so there's some correlation there. And then your squash bees tend to be on squash plants, but surprisingly, we didn't actually catch a lot of those. Those mostly came from the blue vein traps. Um, so uh, yeah, that was, that was interesting, but they are out there and they're pretty abundant. Uh, That's fascinating. Um, okay. Um, curious about the death of bees collected. Is this essential and any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I'm not particularly a fan of euthanizing bees. However, uh, there is an importance to it. Uh, a lot of these bees, especially these dialectus bees, um, are uh, very difficult to identify offhand on the wing. Um, and so the only way to kind of get an accurate identification for them to understand what they're actually doing in the environment and we need to know what they are so we can know how to protect them is to take a couple individuals from the environment. Um, there have been studies that have looked at how uh, kind of damaging it is to the population, um, but there haven't been uh, significant effects found between lethal sampling on the environment. And in my particular case, um, I only came to each site once every two weeks. And so uh, the bees caught on that particular day just was a bad luck day for that particular species of bee. So it'd only be maybe an individual or two collected from that site every two weeks. So it wasn't like I was going too crazy hard on each location, um, but hopefully technologies such as iNaturalist or something like that can uh, catch up to the point where we wouldn't even need uh, lethal sampling. Um, but yeah, there's an importance to it. The answer. Uh, does that include Lewis's mock orange or the mock orange that this bee seems to be a specialist on? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's any uh, mock orange in that genus or anything in the mock orange genus because I think we found it on more than one species of mock orange. Don't quote me on that though. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. Okay, cool. Um, we have many types of goldenrods uh, here, especially in High Park. And you mentioned the Canadensis variety kind of rose to the top. Um, but are there other types that are also attractive to bees? Yeah, I think a uh, tall goldenrod was another common one uh, that we found. Uh, and then I think there's a couple goldenrod that uh, Project Swallowtail actually does have available. Um, but I don't think they were as visited, I don't honestly think they were in bloom that much or a lot of people had them. So it's hard to mm. say if they were even uh, super attractive, but I would imagine they would be because um, a lot of bees do like those, especially later in the season as they're one of the dominant plants out. Yeah, and this this brings up a question that popped into my head as, as you were talking was um, the, you know, this sort of trick part of it, at what point, because there isn't such a high diversity of plants already in urban places, spaces, mm -hmm. um, are the plants that are rising, you know, the patterns that you're finding based on the fact that the plant communities aren't particularly diverse? So like if there was more diversity, the pollinator networks might be different. Like any, any thoughts mm -hmm. on that? Um, yeah. Shift? Uh, it might be, uh, it might change um, because I noticed uh, like, so the Hylotrephium or I don't know, it's a non-native, um, but it had a lot of uh, visits at the high intensity and it was only found at one site, uh, which was a park, which uh, was, there was pretty much nothing else there except for that plant and maybe a handful of other species. Um, so I would imagine it would change especially if you're planting more native plants that native bees have been co-evolving with for millions of years. Um, but I'm not gonna speak definitively on that. Um, but yeah, I, I do okay. think planting specific other plants in there would change the network a bit. Very cool. Um, that brings us to eight o'clock. I don't see any more questions in the chat. And thank you to everyone who asked their questions. Thank you so much, Anthony, for being here and sharing with us. That was uh, super fascinating. Uh, you definitely undersold yourself um, in the in the back room, and then also when you started this. So, uh, yeah, 
if if you want to come back and talk when you're further down the road on on the in your research process that'd be amazing as well but yeah thank you so much for sharing this time thank you everyone for being here uh on a lovely thursday evening there we go that's what day it is thanks clement thanks ryan thanks ali uh thank you everyone um who i can't see but uh have yourselves a great night and i'll be in touch soon bye everyone thanks